On the night of April 14th to 15th, 1912, the most modern and unsinkable ship collided with an iceberg and sunk. And it was incredibly scary. Just imagine a huge cruise ship, several times the size of the Statue of Liberty, crashing into a massive chunk of ice and sinking. It's dark and cold. All you can hear is the rumbling and grinding of breaking metal and wood. All that surrounds you is the icy waters of the endless Atlantic Ocean. There's almost no connection with the outside world. There are no phones or internet. Nobody else on the whole planet knows that the ship is sinking. It's a real nightmare. But the most shocking thing is that the people who were on the Titanic that day didn't panic. They were calm, maybe a little worried, but there was no fear on their faces. To understand why they weren't afraid during one of the biggest disasters of the 20th century, you need to see what was going on through their eyes. So, you're a passenger on the infamous ocean liner. Your cabin is located on one of the top decks of the ship. You've just had a great time with your friends at dinner. Now musicians are playing a beautiful melody. Waiters are serving dessert. You go out onto the deck and enjoy the tranquility of the mighty ocean. At this moment, you feel an incredible sense of security and comfort. You're proud that you're one of the first people in the world to travel on the most high-tech ship on the planet. You go to bed in your cabin and wake up because a crew member gently knocks on your door and asks you to go to the deck. There's some kind of issue, but there's no reason to panic. No problem. You'll be happy to go out and take a look at the night sky. The moment when the ship collided with the iceberg felt like nothing more than a slight push, and some passengers didn't even hear it. They realized that something was wrong only when stewards knocked on their doors and asked them to go outside. You're on the deck. There are already a lot of people here. Everyone is more or less calm. Passengers are talking about what might have happened. Listening to the conversations around you, you figure out that the ship is supposedly sinking. <laughs> the idea seems like nonsense to you. But even if it is true, all passengers will be evacuated in lifeboats anyway. At that time, people didn't know there were half as many rescue boats as needed. Passengers were sure that everyone would be saved. Evacuation begins. Women and children go first. No one panics or tries to get into a boat before it's their turn. All men behave gentlemanly and help crew members to evacuate women. One passenger wants to get into the boat with his wife, but it's not because he's afraid to stay on the Titanic. He's just worried. It seems to him that it's less safe in the boat than on the giant liner. He doesn't want to leave his wife alone, but the crew members explain the situation to him and the man retreats without any resistance. They begin to launch flares into the air. No one pays any attention to this. Everyone thinks this is a standard procedure for a ship breakdown. If there had been many experienced travelers on board, they would have understood the flares were fired because the ship was in distress. Perhaps then, people would have started panicking, but most of the passengers simply didn't notice it. The boats are lowered one by one. People are watching the evacuation patiently waiting for their turn. There is no pushing or crowding. Nobody is screaming. The actions of the crew help the passengers to remain calm. They deliberately downplay the severity of the situation to prevent panic. Someone says the boats are launched simply as a precaution. Also, the crew members claim that a rescue ship is heading for the Titanic and is just a few miles away. Some passengers say they see the lights of another ship. The people who are already sitting in the boats want to stay closer to the Titanic, since this way, they'll feel safer. Many passengers simply don't want to believe that something serious is happening. Even when they're told the ship is sinking, they refuse to admit it. How is it possible that the unsinkable ship can sink? But this is how the human mind works. In extreme situations, it refuses to believe that something bad is going to happen now. You don't even want to think about it. One of the passengers says that it seems to her that the danger is exaggerated. She claims that all people will return to the Titanic at any moment. Some passengers are afraid, and still, they don't want to leave the ship. Warm cabins and the safest ship in the world are here. The alternative is the ice-cold ocean and small, unstable rescue boats. Someone refuses to leave the ship because they can't find their baggage. Some passengers carry all their belongings with them. They don't want to leave them on the sinking ship. There are many immigrants on board, and some of them don't even understand English. The crew members can't explain to them what's happening. 
These passengers misunderstand stewards' instructions during the evacuation. They can't figure out the inscriptions on the evacuation signs. Many passengers are sure there's been some kind of breakdown in the engine compartment. The problem will be solved soon, and the Titanic will continue its journey. People only start to realize that the ship is going down when it begins tilting forward, and its rear part starts rising above the water. That's when those around you start panicking. Some jump into the water, others climb into the lifeboats without waiting in line. But in general, there's no chaos and hysteria. And this is despite the fact that there are about 1,500 people on the ship. Scientists claim that some of them never even left their cabins. Those people refused to leave their stuff behind and didn't believe that something serious had happened. During the evacuation, the orchestra is playing. This helps people to keep their cool. They hear music and it seems to them that everything will be fine. The music keeps playing on the Titanic almost until the very end. At about 2.05 a.m., the crew lowers the last boat with passengers. 15 minutes later, the ship goes underwater. You know SOS, don't you? Three dots, three dashes, and three more dots. It's an easy enough signal to tap out in Morse code. It means save our souls or save our ship. The crew of the legendary Titanic had been desperately trying to send this signal for two hours the night of April 14, 1912. There were other ships not too far from the spot where the iceberg took down the mighty titan of the sea. But the call for help seemingly disappeared before it could reach them. The passenger ship SS Mount Temple did pick up a signal and tried to respond, but the Titanic never got the answer. So what was silencing the ship's cries for help? Some unknown Bermuda Triangle of the North Atlantic? Consider this. Eyewitnesses say the sky was painted with a brilliant aurora borealis that cold, fateful night. Beautiful, yes. But on that day, the northern lights may have sealed Titanic's fate for good. You see, the aurora borealis forms thanks to geomagnetic storms. Sounds complicated, but those are basically fluctuations in the Earth's magnetic sphere. And what causes those is the sun itself. The magnetic sphere is like a protective bubble that surrounds our planet. It blocks harmful solar rays, winds, and other cosmic dangers from reaching us. Without it, life on our planet wouldn't be possible. Earth would look more like Mars. You also have it to thank for compasses pointing north. Experts know the Earth's magnetosphere affects navigational equipment, or disrupts it. Which brings us back to the Titanic. Recently, a published weather researcher named Mila Zenkova proposed a theory that solar flares, which provoked a geomagnetic storm, could have played a major role in the Titanic's untimely demise. Solar flares make themselves known on Earth all the time. Some people are especially sensitive to the magnetic storms they cause. These unlucky folks can feel weakness, fatigue, headaches, and even mood swings. On usual days, the pressure is the same on both sides. The magnetosphere blocks all the bad stuff, and we're all happy. But sometimes, explosions occur on the sun. They can be massive, Earth-sized. These flares shoot out a wave of charged particles that collides with the magnetosphere at high speeds. Our protective bubble then goes on the defense. It shrinks, deforms, and pushes those particles toward the poles. Enter those brilliant lights dancing above the Titanic that night. In the north, we know it as Aurora Borealis. In the south, Aurora Australis, or the Southern Lights. When the magnetosphere pushes those solar and cosmic particles toward the poles, they collide with molecules of different gases. That's why you get the range of colors. For example, oxygen can be green or red, depending on the distance, and nitrogen is blue or purple. What multiple people saw that night was exactly this phenomenon including the second officer from the rescue ship Carpathia. He wrote it down in the logbook before getting the distress call from the Titanic. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Auroras are a visible sign of a geomagnetic storm. Now, about navigational equipment. This applies to satellite and radio frequency devices. Remember, they didn't have iPhones back in the Titanic days, so the average person couldn't notice their gadgets going haywire. But navigational devices and wireless telegraph did exist and were actively used. Rewind back to the Middle Ages, 
when sailors noticed that, on some days, compasses wigged out. The arrows spun in all directions, and people back then had no idea why. It wasn't until the 18th century when French scientists found out that such problematic days occur at the same time as black spots appearing on the sun. Solar flares. The mystery was solved. Now, the Titanic had the most advanced, well-known radio equipment at that time. They tested it thoroughly to make sure it worked for distances up to 2,000 miles away. Titanic's passed them all. On April 10, 1912, The massive liner left Southampton and set off for New York. The very next day, the crew started getting the first reports of drifting icebergs and ice fields. They put dots on the map to mark the coordinates and let out a sigh of relief. All the troublesome spots were north of the Titanic's planned route. But after a couple of days, the warnings were moving farther and farther south, encroaching on the majestic ship. On April 14th, Captain Edward Smith decided to change course to the south in hopes of bypassing the ice. This ended up being a huge mistake. Enter the magnetic storm. If it was throwing the navigation equipment off, even by a tiny error of half a degree, the captain could have been mistakenly taking the ship right toward a cluster of icebergs. What's even worse, the radio operators ignored warnings coming from other ships that or they simply forgot to hand them over to the captain. As hired contractors from the radio company, they were more interested in transmitting paid telegrams from passengers on that luxurious liner. The radio transmitter kept going out of order that evening, probably because of all this private traffic. When it was finally fixed, operator Jack Phillips received another message from the SS Californian at 10.30 p.m. Their operator was trying to warn Phillips about the coordinates of drifting icebergs, but he paid them no attention. He was nervous and in a hurry. Was the magnetic storm to blame for his frayed nerves and bad mood? We can only speculate. together for many years. Where you go, I go. These were the words Ida Strauss said to her husband. One of the richest women on the Titanic didn't end up in a lifeboat. Ida chose to stay behind with her beloved Isidore. Moments earlier, she gave her maid a precious gift that probably saved her life. Isidore and Ida Strauss were both born in Germany and emigrated to the United States as kids. They met in New York and got married five years later. The couple had seven children, but luckily, none of them were on the Titanic. Isidore worked for his father's shop in his late teens. Then, he started a china and porcelain business with his brother that grew into the glassware department at Macy's. Eventually, the brothers took over the entire department store and became multi-millionaires. Isidore and Ida were well known in New York for their wealth, charity, and their incredible love and devotion to each other. Whenever Isidore went on a business trip around the States or to Europe, his wife would go with him. When she couldn't, they'd write long letters to each other every day. The couple visited their native Germany every now and again, too. In 1912, they escaped the bone-chilling New York winter and headed for Europe. By that time, they'd already been married for 40 years. They mostly spent time in sunny southern France and also stopped by Isidore's hometown. In early April, it was time for them to sail back home to New York. They normally traveled on one of those huge German liners they had back then. This time, though, everyone was talking about the new luxury liner, the RMS Titanic. They couldn't resist it and immediately bought up some sweet first-class tickets. On April 10th, they boarded the newest ship of the White Star Line. (laughs) This was going to be great. Ida and Isidore scored one of the 39 private suites at the top of the ship. The tickets cost around $100,000 in today's money. Some of the richest people in the world were staying next to them. The Strausses spent their evenings dining in front of a live orchestra, 
in a hall filled with fancy furniture and expensive wooden paneling. They played chess and backgammon, visited the gym, the swimming pool, even checked out the on-deck squash courts. The luxury didn't last long, though. On the night of April 14th, the ship had its run-in with the most famous iceberg in history. It felt like a slight tremor, a little rumble, that's it. Nobody realized they were in any kind of danger. Passengers even started throwing snowballs made from the chunks of ice that had fallen on the deck. The ship officers told everyone they'd be fine. Moments later, Captain Edward Smith announced it was time to put those life jackets on and get into the lifeboats. All 20 of them were stored on the upper deck. They could have had more, but the ship's designers thought it would make the deck look too messy. There was actually a lifeboat drill scheduled for that day, but instead, they had the real thing. Pretty much only first-class passengers were going to be getting on those lifeboats. The Strausses left their private suite and waited for instructions from the crew. A lot of them were still confident. They told the passengers not to lose their passes. They'd need them when everyone got back on board. That was never going to happen. The ship was going under. The crew announced that women and children would board first. The Strausses were standing next to lifeboat 8. Mr. Strauss, who was 67 at the time, was offered a seat with his wife because of his age. He refused it, saying he was not too old to sacrifice himself for a woman. He wanted to wait and make sure no women and children were left behind. Ellen Bird, Ida's new maid, hesitated before getting on the lifeboat, but Ida told her to go. There was still room for Ida, and the other first-class women were yelling to her to join them. It took about 10 minutes to load each boat. That's how long Ida had to choose her destiny. She took off her beautiful mink coat and handed it to her shivering maid. Ida said she wouldn't be needing it anymore. But the lifeboat wouldn't leave without her. Sailors tried to grab her and force her on the boat. Meanwhile, the Titanic's orchestra was still playing some pretty upbeat music in the background. Crazy. Ida dodged the sailors' hands and stayed on deck. Isidore was begging for her to go. She refused to leave him no matter what. All the survivors in Lifeboat 8 remembered her final words about true love in the face of tragedy. We've lived together for many years. Where you go, I go. It took a whole hour for the first lifeboat to splash down into the icy water. The last memory of the Titanic for many passengers was Isidore and Ida standing arm in arm on deck. More than 200 first-class passengers survived. Some of them said the Strausses sat down peacefully in two deck chairs, holding hands, just waiting. The 25 passengers on Lifeboat 8 spent the rest of the night rowing to safety. They were chasing what they thought were the lights of a ship. It turned out the rescue boat showed up from the opposite direction. They were lucky to be found at all. Many of the passengers, including Ellen Bird, shared the story of Ida and Isidore with reporters, saying it was their most important memory from that horrible night. A month later, around 30,000 people went to their memorial service. Even the mayor of New York showed up. No one seemed surprised the couple gave up their lives for others. Ellen Bird tried to give the famous mink coat back to the Strauss family, but they asked her to keep it in memory of Ida. The only thing that was with the Strausses that night that still exists is a gold and onyx locket. Isidore had it on his pocket watch. The locket had two photos in it, one of their oldest son and one of their oldest daughter. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.